Hey, I have a question for all y'all this morning, okay? I want everybody to put on your thinking caps and listen to this question. I want you to answer it. The question is, has God ever asked you to do something beyond your comfort zone? Yes. <laughs> has God ever asked you to do something that was not, you were not comfortable with? It was beyond your comfort zone. It wasn't something you enjoyed or wanted to do or thought about doing, but you knew that the Lord was putting it on your heart. I think most of us, if we've been following the Lord for any amount of time, We'll have moments in our lives where we know that the Lord is speaking to us about doing something that stretches our boundaries. For me, there's been a number of times. In fact, all my life, the Lord stretched my boundaries. But the biggest boundary stretching moment of my life was I was 18 years old and I was going to summer camp after I'd graduated from high school, getting ready to launch into my life. I had plans. I had colleges lined up. I had ideas about my, what my life was going to be about and they didn't involve ministry. And in my high school summer camp experience, my last summer camp experience as, as a high schooler, I was a Christian, I loved Jesus, I had said I'd follow him anywhere, but my family had uh, been a ministry family, my dad was a pastor when I was younger, he wasn't at the moment, but my grandpa was a pastor, my great-grandpa was a pastor, and on and on and on. And I had decided earlier on that I did not want to go into the family business. <laughs> I loved God, but the church was kind of messed up. And I thought, I don't want to lead the church. I'm not even sure if I'm going to go to church, but I love Jesus. And I was sitting in a high school summer camp um, service. And I was about three quarters of the way back. And I was sitting there not thinking about really anything. I was barely listening to the guy speaking. And a thought came to my mind that was so strong, that was such a strong impression on my heart, something I had literally never had the thought ever, ever in, the, in my whole life. I'd never had this thought, but it was such a strong moment and a strong voice. It wasn't from heaven. I didn't hear it audibly, but I'm telling you, there's only been a handful of times in my life when I've heard a voice this strong in my heart. And here are the words I heard, and I'll explain to them to you in a second. But as I'm watching the guys speak on the stage, I hear these words, I hear the Lord saying, I want you to do that with your life. And if he wasn't saying, I want you to be a speaker, a public speaker. I knew that wasn't the intention. What the intention, what I really believe the Lord was telling me was, I want you to give up your life and surrender to me and go into full-time vocational ministry. This is what you're going to give your whole life to. And I had literally so had never thought that thought before in my life, but I knew it was a strong voice and I knew it wasn't me. And I'm pretty sure it wasn't the devil because the devil wouldn't call you into ministry. And when I heard that voice, I, lit I literally looked to the right of me and I looked to the left of me and I said, I think you're talking to that person. Would you talk a little louder so they can hear you instead of me? I, got, I, just, got, I just sat in the wrong seat. I knew it was the Lord and yet it didn't line up with anything I thought about my life. And I remember thinking I was so shocked. I was so overwhelmed. I was so like... It was like, really me? It's got to be somebody else. It wasn't part of my plan. It wasn't part of my wiring. And it was certainly way outside of my comfort zone. And I remember for the next couple of hours, I was wrestling with the Lord. And I wasn't wrestling to say, no, God, I don't want to say yes. I was wrestling to say, Lord, is this really you? Because if you're speaking to me and you're God, and I gave my life to you a long time ago, and I decided I would surrender to anything you would ask me to do, but I didn't think you were going to ask me to do this. But if it's you, if it's you, I'll do it. But God, I got some questions for you. And I did have some questions. Have you ever had some questions for the Lord? Amen. You have some questions. I, Lord, okay, I'll do it. I'll surrender. But I got some questions about how this works. Listen, maybe for you, it wasn't a strong lifetime kind of word from the heavenlies, right? But maybe for you, it was a still small voice in your heart. Not that talked to you about the rest of your life like that voice talked to me that day, but maybe a still small voice that talks to you about your daily life about something you're supposed to be doing right now and God would call you and it would stretch your boundaries. Maybe, maybe the Lord gave you an insight and made you recognize one of your neighbors that desperately needs Jesus and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about talking to them about Jesus. Maybe, maybe for you, it's, um, you have, a, you have a, a, a space at work during lunch that you could start a Bible study and you've been thinking, maybe I should start a Bible study and you think, wait a minute, where does that thought come from? I don't want to start a Bible study. Who am I to start a Bible study? And you can't get that thought out of your mind and you think maybe it's the Lord speaking to you. Maybe you have a neighbor that's struggling and they've got, been diagnosed with something or, 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 or they're struggling with their job or they don't have enough money to make their ends meet or, 
or, or they're struggling with a relationship and you've had this distinct thought in your heart that you're supposed to go and tell them that you believe in Jesus and that you're gonna pray for them and that you would pray for them. And you're thinking, I don't, I don't know, I can't do that. I'm not ready to do that. I'm not wired to do that. I don't have the skills to do that. That's, that's way beyond my comfort zone. Maybe, maybe it was one of these three names that you wrote down. And, and maybe the Lord's speaking to your heart and saying, instead of just praying for them over the next couple of weeks before Easter, maybe you're supposed to invite them to Easter. And you're supposed to say, hey, would you come with me to church? And I think God's gonna encounter you there. And you think these people aren't interested. I don't know about you, but two of the three people that I wrote down on this card, I actually wrote four down, I cheated, okay? That's just confessing right now. Um, two of the four people I wrote down on this card, I know have absolutely no interest at all in going to church because I've asked. And I'm like, Lord, I don't know if I should do this again, but, but maybe, maybe it's that. But whatever it is, whether it's a lifelong call or whether it's just taking a step of obedience, it's something that you feel like the Lord has spoken, not just in your heart. Maybe he reminded you of a scripture that you've read in the past and he brought it to mind and you know you're supposed to be stepping out, out of your comfort zone, but you don't feel gifted for it. You don't feel qualified for it. You don't feel prepared for it. This is the last sermon in a series called Surrender. Can everybody say the word Surrender surrender. Thanks for being so loud about that. I love that. Because the last few weeks, we've been talking about the angel of the Lord, who is the second person of God. God is Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, co-equal, co-eternal. They, they have existed together forever. They've been working together. They partner together on the same level. But they're one God with three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Son would come as Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. But He would be incarnated as a human being, as Jesus Christ. But before He showed up as Jesus, He was still God. And He still showed up in the Old Testament over and over and over again in the person that we see called the angel of the Lord. When you see this term, the angel of the Lord, you're seeing Jesus, the God God, the, God Jesus, who before he was Jesus, showed up as the Son of God uh, to meet with human beings, to talk with human beings, to engage as God with human beings. And we've been talking about the angel of the Lord. And while we only talked about Abraham and Jacob and today talking about Moses, we could go on and on. I love a story about the angel of the Lord engaging, um, uh, 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 excuse me, Ishmael and um, Ishmael's mother. What's her name? H Hagar. Thank you. Wow, I should go to Bible college, shouldn't I? <laughs> My brain just wasn't working. I love that story. If you ever want to read a great story about grace and mercy, that's a great story. I love the story about the angel of the Lord showing up, the commander of the Lord's army showing up with Joshua when he says, who are you for, us or our enemies? And he said, neither. By the way, that's a good story because we want God to be for us and not for our enemies. And he says, I'm not for anybody. You take off your shoes and worship me here. Shoot, I could preach that sermon right now, but I'm not going to. <laughs> I love the story of the, of, the, of, the, of the exiles, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who are thrown into the fiery furnace because they didn't bow down and worship the image of the king. And while they were in this furnace that was supposed to burn them alive, there was a fourth person in the furnace. That's the angel of the Lord. That's Jesus before he shows up as Jesus. But we've been talking about the fact that whenever the angel of the Lord shows up, so often human beings surrender. They take off their shoes. They fall on their face. They say, God, what do you want with me? They go away and say, I've seen God face to face, and yet my life was spared. They surrender their lives to him. And we've been finding out in this series that surrender is the key to life. Surrendering to God is the, say the. the. Not a, uh, it's the key to life. I really believe that with all of my heart. I believe that in scripture. I believe that in my own life. In fact, when it says that if you believe in your heart that Jesus was raised from the dead, that the father raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. Jesus is Lord is not just three words we string together religiously to check off a box. Oh, I said out loud, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord means that I'm declaring something that's becoming true about my life, that Jesus is in charge of everything that I surrender to him for everything. And I don't always get it right, but I'm going to continue to surrender to him. I'm gonna keep surrendering. I'm gonna keep repenting. I'm gonna keep picking myself up and saying, Lord, you're giving me the grace to move on. And I will surrender my intentions to you even if my actions don't always get it right. How many of you are glad that God doesn't require perfect actions, but he asks for our surrender? Yeah. yeah. And so we've been finding that surrender is the key to life. 
and surrender to the Lord in our will, in our actions, in our attitudes will, will lead to this. And I want to tell you, it will lead to something that's not comfortable. If you're surrendering to the Lord, if you're living a life of not surrendering, if you're, if you're playing a game with God, or if you're a nominal Christian, if you've said yes to Jesus and you're doing just enough to skate by and hopefully have a ticket into heaven, I'm not saying that you can't get to heaven that way, but I am saying you're not going to live like heaven that way. Heaven's not going to live through you that way. And if you really want heaven to live through you while you're here on earth, it requires surrender to the Lord. And if you surrender to the Lord, I'm going to guarantee you something, okay? Ready? This is not a hard sell because this is not how you sell things to people. When you sell things to people, you tell them all the benefits. But I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, if you surrender to the Lord, he will call you to do something outside of your comfort zone. Right? Now, who wants to sign up? Okay? <laughs> He will call you out of your comfort zone. He will ask you to do something that you don't feel qualified to do, that you don't think you can handle. He's going, somebody once said, God will never give you more than you can handle. That's not true. <laughs> if you surrender the Lord, he will always give you more than you can handle because he can handle it. And we're going to learn how to give it to him so that he can handle it. But when God calls us out of our comfort zone, when we get that, when we grasp it, when we know what he's asking us to do, we often have questions for the Lord. We come to a place where we say, Lord, I want to surrender all to you, but I got questions about how this is going to work. And today we're going to talk about a man who had questions when he was called of the Lord. This man's name was Moses, and he's very important in the Old Testament. Moses is the one who God uses to lead his people, his special chosen possession, Israel, out of bondage from Egypt. Moses is called to lead them out of Egypt, out of bondage, through the Red Sea, into the desert to receive the, 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 the law and the, and the requirements for worship so that they can be prepared to go into the promised land. And all of that is a precursor. It's a foreshadowing of our salvation. We each are born into bondage in Egypt. We're born into bondage of a slave driver named the enemy, named Satan, and Jesus came to deliver us because he died on the cross. He was the perfect lamb of God. The blood that was smeared over the doorpost that saved all the firstborn. It was like Jesus' blood applied to our lives. And then we're led out of bondage through the Red Sea. The New Testament calls that baptism. They were baptized into Moses. We're baptized into Jesus through the Red Sea. We leave, by the way, if you've never been baptized, you should be baptized. Because there's a moment right there where you submit and surrender to the Lord, and it's like going from bondage and uh, captivity into freedom. And then, and then we're led to receive the word of God and the understanding of worship so that we can be equipped to walk into a promised land. All, all of that salvation history we find in the Old Testament with Moses. Moses is really important, but here's how Moses starts his life. He's born into a, an environment where the king of Egypt was so afraid of the Israelites. They had been growing and expanding for hundreds of years. He says, man, they're going to grow so big, they're going to take over. So we have to kill all the male babies so there's not procreation, so there's not a multiplication and so he made an edict that every male baby that was born to an Israelite woman, a Jewish woman, would have to be killed by throw, being thrown into the Nile. Moses was born in that time period, in that context. But instead of his mother killing him, she feared God. She kept him as long as she could. And then instead of throwing him into the Nile, she got creative and she made a little ark, a little uh, boat uh, and it was filled with pitch so that the water wouldn't get into it, so it would float. And she put him into this little bassinet that floated and put him in the Nile. And then his sister Miriam kind of watched out to see what would happen, where this baby would end up going. God had this baby float right to the feet of Pharaoh's daughter. And Pharaoh's daughter picked up the basket and saw a baby in it and said, hey, this is one of those Hebrews that they've been throwing, or we told them to throw into the Nile. By the way, they didn't actually do it. Um, but we told them to throw it in the Nile. And look, there, there's a baby in the Nile and I'm going to take him and I'm going to adopt him. And so Moses, not only was he a Jew, but he was also raised in the household of Pharaoh. Being raised in the household of Pharaoh, he got every advantage. He got all the education. He had all the resources. He was kind of living in two cultures, but he had everything going for him. When he was 40 years old, he saw an Egyptian slave master mistreating a Hebrew slave and he decided he would step in and help out the Hebrew brother that he had that he really didn't know. 
And when he stepped in, he ended up killing the Egyptian slave master. And at that moment, Pharaoh turns against him and starts pursuing him. Moses thinks he's going to die at Pharaoh's hands. And so he leaves the whole thing. He runs away from everybody. He runs away from Pharaoh. He runs away from God's people, from his own people. He probably runs away from God. He runs into the desert where he knows nobody. And he meets a woman, ends up marrying her, her, his, her father, his father-in-law is Jethro, the priest of Midian. And for 40 years, he's out there tending Jethro's flocks in the desert, not connected with anybody he knew in Egypt. And one day, something really crazy happens. And that's where I want to pick up the story in Exodus chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Exodus 3. If not, we'll have it up on the screen, starting in verse 1. It says this. Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. And Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Moses hears the voice of the angel of the Lord. Jesus is in the burning bush and Moses stops to see what's going on. He stops to recognize what's happening. He stops to listen to what's going on. I don't know about you, but if I'm walking around the Hollywood Hills and there's a bush on fire, I'm not stopping, I'm running. <laughs> and I'm calling the fire department. Especially if it's August, right? And it's draw the green, right now, beautiful around LA. In August, it's gonna be brown, right? And especially then, because you'd be afraid of fire. And this is a desert environment where if a bush is on fire, you would think, oh my goodness, what's happening? But it says Moses stopped to pay attention. He stopped to see what was going on. He stopped to say, now there's a bush on fire, but hmm, it's not burning up. What's going on here? Jesus is getting Moses' attention. But I want to tell you before we move on this, that Moses has to be paying attention for Jesus to get his attention. And church, we have to be paying attention for Jesus to get our attention. And we are being called to pay attention because God's presence will manifest in our lives and he will speak to us. He will remind us of what we've read in the word of God. He will remind us of what we've heard in church together. He will remind us of the things he's told us. The Holy Spirit will speak to us. He'll never contradict the word, but he'll tell us things in our hearts, still small voice. We'll feel an urging to do something. But how many of you know that God will speak to your heart, but if you're not paying attention, you're not gonna hear it? And we have to learn how to stop and pay attention. I love that God said, Moses, take off your shoes for the place where you're standing is holy. He had to do something, an action that he had to perform, that he had to move from where he was, comfortable in his shoes, comfortable in his shoes that would have protected him from the desert sand, that would have protected him from the desert critters, the shoes that he wore that, that took care of his feet. He had to take them off and not have anything between his feet and the holy ground he was standing on so he could listen to the Lord. And sometimes I feel like we don't stop to listen to the Lord. Amen. Almost every week as we're worshiping together in this space, and the building isn't holy. I mean, it is holy in the sense that it's set apart to the Lord. This building is set apart to the Lord. But God doesn't live in temples made by human hands anymore. God says he lives in the temple of the human heart. Amen. And when we gather together, there's something really awesome and tangible and awesome that happens with the presence of the Lord starts to manifest. Listen, God's presence is everywhere always, right? Amen. But God's presence manifests as we come together. And so often when we come together, there's this sense that, wow, the Lord is really here. Have you ever felt that? Yes. The Lord is really here. And I wonder if sometimes when we feel that the Lord is really here, if we just go, wow, that's really cool. I'm glad you're here, Lord. And then we just keep singing the songs we're singing. Or if we stop, if we stop, sometimes, I think most of the time figuratively, but really sometimes literally, I have to take off my shoes. 
I have to take off my shoes and just say, Lord, I recognize that your presence is really strong right now, and I don't want to move on until you've spoken to me, until you've gotten my attention. Maybe it's something you need to correct me about, or it's something I need to repent for. Maybe it's something that I've not been doing that you've asked me to do, and you need to remind me of that. Maybe it's something I read in my scripture and devotions that I've not act- activated. Maybe it's something brand new, but God, I want you to speak to me. Sometimes you'll see me just on my knees in worship, And I know sometimes where you're sitting, that's really hard to do, but I just want to take a different position to say, God, would you speak to me today? There's something new. There's something fresh that's happening, and I want to pay attention to what you're saying. I don't want to just sing songs. I want to pay attention to your voice. I want to be changed. Sometimes I'm talking to somebody. I'm having coffee with somebody, and the Holy Spirit's just pouring wisdom through them, and they don't even know it. But they're speaking, and like I'm hearing God speak to me through their voice. Anybody? That ever happened to you? Somebody, and you're going, wow. And I li- I'll take out my phone and I have to say, I'm not texting somebody or checking my social media right now. I'm writing a note based on something you just said. And it's fun when I'm out to like coffee with people from the church and I'm like, I, God's speaking to you through, to me through you and I got to write a note. And they're like, Pastor Tim, you're writing a note based on what I just said? I'm like, yeah, it's probably going to show up in a sermon. Do I have to pay you for it? Do you get residuals? I don't know. I don't know how that works. Um, We want to stop. We want to stop and pay attention to what the Lord is saying. Sorry, I feel like Mr. Rogers right now. (laughs) Won't you be my neighbor? Okay. Let's let the Lord get our attention because when he gets our attention and he's speaking to us, we're listening. A lot of times it's for a reason. He wants to tell us something. He wants to, he wants to, urge us to do something, to make a change, to move forward, to step into a, uh, outside of a comfort zone. So in verse 9, it goes on. God starts, by the way, in verse 7 to say, hey, I've heard, I've heard the cry of my people in Egypt. They're, they're being oppressed. Somebody needs to go and deliver them. So in verse 9, he says this, um, now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So Moses now go. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. He gets our attention. He's getting Moses' attention for a reason, because he wants his people to be free. And the reason the Lord will speak to us so often is so that we can walk into freedom, because he hates it when we're in bondage. Listen to me. He doesn't hate us. He hates the bondage that keeps us away from everything that he intends for our lives. And we're living in bondage and he wants to free us. But more than just freeing you, he wants to free other people in your life. There are people living in captivity and bondage that we know that God loves so dearly and deeply. And he wants to call us to be a part of the solution to help other people walk into freedom. So often when he's speaking to us, he's preparing our lives to help other people walk into freedom. But Moses hears this and he thinks to himself, there is no reason that God would use me. I'm a murderer. I have a rough past. I ran away from God a long time ago. I gave up my potential. I had all of this education and all of this resource and I threw it all away. I've wasted my potential. It's too late to start over And God spoke to me a long time ago and I said, no, why would God ever use me now? Friends, maybe you feel the same way today. Maybe you feel like, why would God ever use me now? I had potential, but I threw it all away. I had a call, but I walked away from it. I had an idea that God would maybe use me for something, but that was a long time ago. I can hardly even remember what he said to me then. Man, I've got a rough past. I've hurt people. I've destroyed people. I've done things, how could God use me? And you may think there is no way that God can use me, but I wanna tell you the story of this story and the story of grace in the Bible is that God is a redemptive God. And that God can use you regardless of what you've done in the past or even what you've done right now. I wanna tell you that it is not too late for God to use you. You might say, yeah, God spoke to me many years ago about something and I said no, so he's not gonna give me a second chance. I don't know about you, but I serve the God of second chances. I really do. And you might even think to yourself, well, that's good. I'm too old. 
Let the young people do it. I, there's no way I'm too old. Moses was 80 years old when he got called. And God spoke to him and said, you're going to deliver my people Egypt. Can I tell you something? That you may even be sitting there with a diagnosis that the doctor said you're going to die in a few months. First of all, we pray that that diagnosis is not from the Lord and you're not going to die in a few months. But secondly, even if you do, if you've got four months left on this earth, you've got four months left that God can use you and change the world. You are, it is not too late. God is not done with you. There is no stop to God's mercy to use you. But Moses heard the Lord and he wanted to surrender to this God that he's getting to know now but he has questions. And when God speaks to us to get us out of our comfort zone and we have to get out of our shoes and get out of our comfort zone, we have questions too. In fact, we often have the same five questions that Moses has that I want us to go through in the next few minutes. The first question is this, who am I? Who am I? I think all of us have asked that question, right? Let's all say it together. Who am I? Who am I? Why would you pick me? I remember as a kid growing up, I was not very athletic. I played some sports, but I just was not naturally gifted athletically. Does anybody want to admit to that also? Were you in? Okay. Everybody's like, no, I was sport. <laughs> and I was never the last person chosen for, you know, on the recess when they chose you for like kickball or something like that in PE where they chose, they probably don't do that anymore because that's really bad for our self-esteem. So we probably don't do that anymore. But when I was growing up as a Gen Xer, they didn't care about our self-esteem, okay? And they would pick you, and like, I would never be the very last chosen, but I was, you know, somewhere in the middle. I literally remember one time in my life for kickball, and they started choosing teams, and the first pick of the first team, the guy said, I want to have Timmy Clark on my team. Timmy, that's what my name was, okay? And I literally was like, What? Why would he choose me? I don't understand that to this day. It was a bad choice. I lost the game for them. Never got picked first again, but one time I got picked first. And literally I'm looking around and going, is there another Timmy Clark in the, in the class? The new kid come to class, he has my same name. Why would you pick me? And that's what Moses is thinking. I already blew it. I already messed up my life. Why would you pick me? Let's talk about this. In verse 11, it says this, Moses said to God, who am I? God calls Moses, you're gonna go and deliver my people from Egypt. And Moses says, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. I will be with you. Get this, Moses says, who am I? Who am I, right? And you think that God would be like, well, I'll tell you who you are. You you're somebody that I, I sovereignly placed in Pharaoh's household and gave you a lot of, uh, a, a lot of skills and language learning and, and resources and you got connections and relationships. Or, or Moses said, who am I? And God would have said, hey, hey, buddy, you need to have better self-esteem there. Um, you need to like, like buck yourself up. You're somebody important. Moses says, who am I? And what does God say? I will be with you. And Moses says, I don't think you heard me right, God. Who am I? I asked who I was. And God says, I will be with you. And Moses says, no, 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 God, I didn't ask you who you were. I asked you who I was. Who am I? And God says, I will be with you. Because church, we can look all day long within ourselves for the answer and you're not going to find it. Only God has the answer. God is outside of us. Our world tells us if you find your true self, if you really dig deep and follow your own bliss, if you find who you really are, then everything's going to work out. And can I tell you that is not the gospel? Because when I look in deep down and find my true self, I find a man who was born in sin and death and who has destruction all over me. And when I follow my own bliss and my own true self, I hurt a lot of people and I hurt myself. And then God comes along and says, I'm going to redeem your true self, and you're not going to find the answers within yourself. You're going to find them within me. Amen. See, the oldest lie in the book, the literal oldest lie in the book, when Satan comes to Adam and Eve and starts to tempt them, 
the lie is you can be your own God. If you follow your own bliss, if you follow your own desires, if you just find your true self, then God is within you. And I want to tell you, that's actually not good news. That's bad news because I can never find God if I look deep. I'm going to find God outside of me and then he's going to come and fill me up and then he's going to be within me. And that's the gospel. That's the gospel. Deborah and I were um, with some friends uh, in Waco, Texas. Um, we were doing some college visits with our, with our girls. And we were in Waco, Texas, and we were at the Magnolia Bakery having breakfast. And the waitress came up to us and started very chatty, Elaine, very uh, exuberant, started talking to us. And, and we find out as she's talking to us that she's a believer. And she made it clear that she was a believer. And in fact, I think that if I would have just stayed quiet and let her, she would have tried to evangelize and save me. <laughs> Which would have been really fun to be like, yeah, I need Jesus, yes. And, but I couldn't. I, I, I said, we're pastors. And so we started talking about her testimony as we, we admitted that we were pastors. She was so excited about giving us her testimony. And her testimony was this, that her life had fallen apart. Her relationships had fallen apart. Everything about her life had fallen apart. She had left school and gone back to where she grew up and life wasn't going good at all. And one day she realized this. She said, I had to stop looking within myself. I, started, I had to stop looking in and I had to start looking up. And that's when Jesus got a hold of her. And that's when her life was changed radically. You guys, there's a whole industry out there that takes your money to tell you who you are. Really, you can take any kind of test there is out there, right? You can take the DISC test, the Myers-Briggs test, the Enneagram, that test that tells you whether you're a bear or an otter or a lion or something like that. All of those things are out there. And, and I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't find out who we are, but I'm telling you something you're not going to find your purpose in life and your calling by looking deep within yourself. You're going to find it by looking up to God. And Moses says, who am I that I should be called to that? God doesn't say, you need more self-esteem. You need to think more of yourself. He says, I will be with you. And if you'll surrender your life to me, I'm going to be with you for the rest of your life and I will give you a purpose you couldn't have ever dreamed about. Who, are you? who am I that you would call me? Number two, Moses says, who are you? Okay, if you're calling me then, if my answer to who am I is who you are, then who are you? Because I've heard about you. When I grew up, I heard about the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, but I don't know this God. I've heard about this God. I know who, the kind of God you are, but I don't know you personally. So who are you? You person, you God that wants to define my life, who are you? And it says in verse 13, Moses says to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? See, the gods that the Egyptians worshipped were all very unique gods. They were specific gods. They were gods for something. If you needed more crops, you worshipped the god of the crops. If you needed to have kids, you worshipped the god of fertility. If you needed your enemies destroyed, you worshipped the god of war. If you needed something, you worshipped the god that corresponded to that thing. They were used to hearing about gods that were very specific gods for a very specific time for a very specific purpose. But when Moses said, what shall I tell the Israelites when they say, who has sent me to you? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are saying to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God is saying, I am not a God of one thing, but I am a God who is defined as I am. I exist. There's nothing outside of me. There is no God higher than me. There is no God greater than me. I am who I am can also be translated, I will be what I will be. You don't get to define me. I will define myself, and that's my proper name, is that I am. I am everything you need. I am the first and the last, the beginning and the end. I am what I am, and nothing else exists besides me. Listen, everything exists for me. I created everything, and you're worshiping the God of the universe. That's who I am. Moses needs to know who God is so he can tell other people 
And sometimes we know about God, but we need to to fully surrender to the Lord for the purposes he has for us. We need to find out who he is. Here's what I love. He's having this conversation with the angel of the Lord. It makes that clear early in Genesis, I'm sorry, in Exodus 3. And when Jesus Christ shows up, in fact, after Easter, we have an eight-week series on the nature and the identity of Jesus, his self-revealed nature, Because all the way through John, when people asked him who he was or when he wanted to speak about who he was, he would say these things. I am the good shepherd. I am the bread of life. I am the vine. I am the resurrection and the life. And we're gonna week by week talk about that. But my favorite is in John chapter eight, in verse like 58, he's having an argument with the Pharisees and the Pharisees are telling him, we are children of Abraham. We are important. People are afraid of me. I drive a Dodge Stratus. Nobody's going to get that reference except a couple of you. People are afraid. of People, we're important. We're Abraham's children. And Jesus says this. He says, I want to tell you the truth. Before Abraham was born, I am. Period. God's proper name revealed to Moses, revealed to the people of Israel was I am, Yahweh. Jesus says before Abraham was even born, I am, I exist, I will be what I will be. And some people say, well, maybe you, you misunderstood what Jesus was saying. They didn't misunderstand what Jesus was saying because they picked up rocks to kill him because he was declaring that he was equal to God. When you want to know who God is, we recognize that he is everything we need And when we get ready to surrender to the Lord, by the way, it's a right question. Who are you, Lord? Because the more we know Jesus, the more we want to surrender. The more you know who Jesus is in your life, the more you know how much he has for your life, the more you know that he's not going to hold back, the more you know that his resource is available to you, the more you know about his grace and his mercy, the more you know about his loving kindness and his goodness, the more you know about how much he loves you, the more you know that, not just hear it in your ears, but you know it in your heart, the more you know that, the more you're going to be ready to say, Lord, you have my life. I surrender everything to you. God, I believe you. Here's the third question. What if it doesn't work? What if it doesn't work? Sometimes God will ask us to do something and we think maybe it's not going to work. God, you're, I, I think that Holy Spirit, you're asking me to speak to my neighbor about coming to church, but I've asked my neighbor to church like nine times and they've said no every time. What if it doesn't work? What if you ask me to do something that's not going to work and I'm going to fall flat on my face and then I'm going to be embarrassed? What if I don't have the resource to make it happen? In chapter four, as Moses continues to talk to the angel of the Lord, it says this in chapter four, verse one, Moses said this, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't listen to me? And what if they say, the Lord did not really appear to you? And then the Lord said to him, what is this in your hand? A staff, he replied, And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. And Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. Don't diss Moses here, okay? Because if you had a stick in your hand and you threw it on the ground and it became a snake, what would you do? Most of you would run away. Some of you are like, I'd cut the head off of the snake. (laughs) Moses ran away. Moses is saying, you're calling me to go and talk to Pharaoh about letting Israel go. But what if he doesn't listen to me? What if he doesn't believe I actually met with you? And God says, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen is I'm going to use your life miraculously. And you're going to bring this staff to to Moses or to Pharaoh and and you're going to do this miracle. And then then that's going to lead to letting him go. Here's the thing. Moses did go to Pharaoh And he did bring the staff and he did do exactly what God said and Pharaoh just laughed at him and said, oh yeah, my magicians can do that too. And Moses had to keep hearing God about going back to Pharaoh again and again and again and again and again. And it looked like he failed nine times. He tried nine times to go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. And then he went back and God said, go again. And at some point, it's not in the scripture, but I can imagine Moses saying, God, I've done this like eight times and it hasn't worked yet. Like it's gonna be my head pretty soon. And God said, go back, go back, go back. I'm going to use you. See, we have to trust God that he is going to be good at his word. 
And here's the thing that we have to remember. When we ask what if it doesn't work, we have to remember that God is going to use the resources in our lives that we don't even understand that they could be supernatural resources. Moses' staff was a normal shepherd's staff. It wasn't this, God didn't say, hey, Moses, wait there. Let me go back behind the bushes and get, bring you a really cool magic staff. And this magic staff is important and it's gonna work for you. That's not what God did at all. He said this, Moses said, what if it doesn't work? God says, what do you have in your hand? And we say, what if it doesn't work? And God says, what do you have in your hand? Moses had in his hand the shepherd's staff he'd been using for years to protect the sheep, to defend against wild animals. It was a staff like every other staff. There was nothing special about that staff until God touched it. And there's something you have in your life and there is nothing special about it. There's nothing supernatural about it. You think, I don't have the resource to do what God's asking me to do. And he says, no, you have the resource. You just need to let me touch it and I'm gonna make it supernaturally effective. Remember the story in the New Testament of the feeding of the 5,000? How did they feed 5,000 people with one little boy's lunch? A few loaves, a few fishes, and it's brought to Jesus. And when Jesus touches it, that very normal, unsupernatural resource all of a sudden becomes a supernatural resource used to feed over 5,000 people. And Moses has a very normal staff, but when he lets the Lord touch it, when he gives it to the Lord and surrenders it to the Lord, the Lord uses it for his purposes. And I'm telling you, you may not feel like you have any supernatural ability or any kind of resource supernaturally, but when you surrender what you have to the Lord, he will use it supernaturally to get done what he's asking you to do. And sometimes it's going to take time after time after time after time. What if the Lord speaks to your heart and tells you you should start a Bible study and you have a Bible study and nobody shows up? Well, then open up your doors again next week and open up your doors again next week and do it again and do it again until the Lord tells you to stop. What if the Lord tells you, what if you feel the Spirit telling you to invite your neighbor to church and you think to yourself, I've already invited them to church like eight times. I'm embarrassed to ask them again. How do you know that the ninth time God isn't going to use something supernaturally in your life? In fact, this card we've been giving out the last few weeks, we've got them available on the way out if you want them. There's just a little invitation to Easter. It just has the times. It has a QR code. It has a website. Nothing special about this, right? Is it possible that when you hand it to somebody, it becomes a supernatural tool and that they don't even know it at the time and they say, no, I'm not interested and they throw it on their, they throw it away and it lands on the top of their dresser and on Saturday night before Easter, they take a look at it and something in their heart goes, you know what? I've said no so many times. I'm gonna finally go to the church with them. Who knows what God can use in your life if you will supernaturally allow your resources to be touched by and used by God. Number four, fourth question is this. Moses says, what if I can't do it? What if I don't have the goods? What if I can't do it? Verse 10 of chapter four, Moses says to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past, (laughs) neither in the past, nor since you've spoken to your servant. And these, Lord, I wasn't eloquent in the past, but since you've spoken to me about a half an hour ago, nothing changed. (laughs) I'm slow of speech and tongue. You can see that. I'm having a hard time talking to you. And the Lord said to him, who gave human beings their mouth? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go and I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Moses says, God, thank you for calling me to go lead your people out of Egypt, but I can't string two words together. I'm not eloquent. I don't have the goods. I'm not enough. What if I'm not enough? And God says this to him. And if you ask the same question, what if I'm not enough? God says the same thing to you. You are not enough. You're not enough. What a great sermon, right? I'm telling you, God's going to call you out of your comfort zone. You're not enough. You're not. The whole point of surrendering to God is that he's enough. The whole point of surrendering to the Lord is saying, I don't have the skills. I'm not enough. I don't have it. I don't have the skill, the talent, the gifts. I lack that. But God would say this to you. 
I, child, I have been preparing you since before the day you were born. God's not just preparing you from the day you were saved. He has been preparing your life from before the day you were born to get you ready for the thing that he is calling you to. It might be huge, like leading millions of people out of Egypt. It might be small, like speaking to your neighbor about Jesus and praying for their healing and it happened. But whether it's big or little, God has been preparing you to be used for his purposes all your life. All your life. You are not enough in your own, but when the Holy Spirit is given to you, you are enough. When we will surrender to him, he's going to use your whole life, your past, your good, your bad, your ugly. How many of you have had good, bad, and ugly in your past? Okay, 10 of us, the rest of you. The rest of you are like only ugly, only (laughs) good, bad, and ugly. And by the way, not just in your past, God will transcend your current shortcomings too. The things you fall short on now, God's gonna meet you halfway. He'll meet you the whole way, in fact. He'll change your life. Surrender what you have, whatever you have, and God will use it. Okay, Lord, I've got this card they gave me at church. Surrender that to you. Lord, I have a few bucks. That person who needs something, you're telling me to, I'm feeling like my heart, I'm supposed to give it to them. I'm going to do it. I, I don't know what that's going to do. Lord, you've sovereignly placed me in this house or this apartment, and I live right next to this really horrible person. But you're not asking me to just be mad at this horrible person that's always mean to me. You're asking me to surrender and, and pray for them every day and maybe share Jesus with them. See, when I was called to a lifetime of ministry, I I was arguing with the Lord, not about whether I would say yes or not, because I'd already determined long ago in my life that I was going to surrender to everything that God would ask me to do. But I was was saying, Lord, I don't understand why you would call me. I'm not, I feel so much like Moses when I responded to the Lord, because I literally said, Lord, I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to string two words together. I'm not comfortable being myself in front of people. I grew up in theater and I would always take on a role and I was comfortable being somebody else in front of people. But I'm gonna tell you week after week when I stand up here in front of you and preach the word of God, it feels like I am ripping my soul open. It's just me. Which by the way, for me, not this isn't for ever, true for every preacher, but for me, the Lord told me I could never fully script out my sermons because then I would be doing it in my own power, not in his power. And so I can't memorize a script like I would do in a play. I've got to say, Lord, here's what I've got. Here's what I've got. I said, Lord, my voice is not deep enough to be a pastor. It's like this punk rock surfer skater kid voice that's like way up here. God, I don't own a suit. I don't know how to tie a tie. My hair is a mess. It still is. I... I remember wrestling with the Lord, not because I didn't believe him, but because I'm thinking, Lord, how can you use this mess? How can you use this mess to get your purposes done? Lord, I'm not that kind of put together, really great, awesome looking, sounding, really, really, really good orator. I don't, I say like too many times and um too many times. And I remember hearing the still small voice of the spirit. This wasn't that strong call that I heard when he spoke to me a couple of hours before, but just that heart thing that you hear from the Lord that you know, this is probably the Lord because it's not the enemy and it's not me and it lines up with scripture. But here's what I heard Jesus tell me. He said, you say, Tim, you say yes to what I'm asking you to do and I'll fully use who I've made you to be. Tim, you surrender all. And whatever you're surrendering, even if you think it's just a little bit, I'm going to use it for your, my purposes. Okay, last question, then we're going to be done. Verse, 14, verse 13 of chapter 4, I love his last question. It's actually not a question, it's a statement. After he argues with the Lord and says, Lord, I'm not sure I'm the right guy. I'm not sure I have the resource. I'm not sure. Lord, they're not going to listen to me. Who are you? Here's his last statement to the Lord. Pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Thanks, Lord. 
Thank you that you're going to use me. Thank you that you're going to, you know, the staff, that was a great trick. I love that. <laughs> Thanks for the snake and all that. All, thank you, Lord. But, but could you use somebody else? And although God said, yeah, I'm going to help. I'm going to, I'm going to send you help. I'll send you your brother Aaron's going to help you. I want you to know that the answer to the question, would you send somebody else, was no. No. God didn't say he would use somebody else. God had prepared Moses for that moment in his life, the 40 years of wandering, the attempt early on at helping his Hebrew brother, his birth situation, his growing up situation, all of it. God had prepared Moses to use him uniquely and God has prepared you to use you uniquely. It's not about what you bring to the table, like, oh, look at me, look how cool I am. It's about God saying, I've been working in your life the whole time. And I wanna tell you that right now, there's nobody else in this moment, in this season. On March 17th, 2024, there's nobody else who's supposed to be preaching this sermon right now than me. I want you to hear that. It's not prideful. It's that God is using me right now for a specific purpose and a specific reason. And if I would have prayed in the back before the sermon and got on my knees and said, God, would you please use anybody else? I have a feeling that he would say, nope, get out there and talk. Get out there and talk. And that's great for me, right? Yay? But it's great for you. Somebody out there just like, no, don't make me come up and do a sermon. Not the sermon, but God has gifted you and placed you and anointed you and shaped you to be who he needed to be right where you are on March 17, 2024. And he's not going to use anybody else to do the thing that he's asking you to do. He's not going to use anybody else to do the one thing that he's asking you to do, that he's put on your heart. I love this. Moses didn't want to do it, but he did it anyway. And that's the definition of surrender. Don't discount what God can do with a fully surrendered person. You don't think you have the goods. You don't think you have the talent. You don't think you're good enough. You don't think you've got your life together enough. I want to tell you something. None of it matters. Man, we're running out of time, but I just want to stop. I want you to hear this, not from my heart. I want you to hear this from God's heart. Don't discount what God can do with you if you're fully surrendered. Don't look at the, the brokenness. Don't look at the failures. Don't look at all the stuff that you've tripped up in. I don't care who you are, what you've done, where you've come from, what your gift mix is, what kind of talents you have, what your personality profile is, how much money you have, how long you've been a Christian. I wanna tell you right now, God not only can, but deeply desires to use you to change the world if you will surrender everything to him. And here's what he does. And he did it with Moses and he does, does it with us. He frees people from their bondage. Moses, who was a captive of Egypt, goes back to captivity. He goes back into captivity to help release God's people. But in releasing God's people, he himself becomes released as well. God wants to bless you to be free from bondage so that you can help other people be free from bondage. And that's always going to take us out of our comfort zone. It's never going to be something we feel qualified for. But if we'll surrender to him, he will use us for that purpose. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful that you will use us for the purposes that you've created us for. Lord, that you look at every human being on the face of the earth and your desire for them, God, your deep love for them compels you to work with your people, to extend your life and your love to extend your freedom, God. To each one of us be called to be like Moses that helps people find freedom from bondage and deliverance from captivity. So Lord, we surrender everything to you because you are only worth surrendering to. We hand you all of our own resources, Lord, because you can do something supernatural with it. And we say that even if we don't want to do it, even if it's uncomfortable for us, God, you can do something mighty and eternal 
through a person who surrendered fully to you. Church, I just want you to continue to think about that. You may need to surrender to the Lord. You may need to surrender to the Lord. I know I need to surrender. There's something I need to surrender to the Lord. There may be things you have not surrendered to the Lord and you would say, Lord, I'm willing to surrender. I may not get it perfect, but Lord, my heart is that I want to say yes to whatever you ask me to do so I can be a conduit of your grace. If that's you in this room, would you just put your hands up in front of you and say, that's me. Lord, there are hands going up all over this room, including my own. There are areas of my life that I I don't even recognize that are unsurrendered, but when you point them out to me, God, I am willing to surrender everything to you. And so all of us, Lord, we surrender to you. Use us for your purposes. Use us for your purposes. Put your hands down, but keep your eyes closed if you would. If you're here and you've never surrendered to the Lord, you've never come to the cross, Jesus died on the cross for us. Jesus was that perfect lamb that was sacrificed for us. Jesus frees us from bondage. He trains us and he shapes us so that we can walk into his promise. But we need to come and receive his life that he gave us on the cross and through his resurrection. We need to say, Jesus, you're gonna be the Lord of my life. If you've never said, Jesus, you're Lord, and you want to do that today, or maybe you have said that, but you haven't been living that way, and today you would turn back to the Lord. Just put your hand up and look at me, and I want to agree with you that Jesus is Lord of your life today, either for the first time or you're coming back to him. Okay, I agree with you. I agree with you. Who else? Wave at me if I miss you. I'm just looking around the room. Say, that's me. Okay, yeah. I see you there and there and there and there. I see you. I agree with you. Just say, yeah, that's me. That's me. Anybody? Okay, looking around. Want to make sure I catch everybody? Yep, I see you. Thank you. I'd missed you before. Yeah, right here and here and here. I agree with you. I agree with you. Yes, I agree with you. Anybody else? I'm going to look around one more time. Lord, thank you for every hand that went up, every heart that opened to you, people online that are saying yes to you, that want to surrender to you. Lord, we recognize that a surrendered people, individuals and church will change the world, not because we're great, but because the one we surrender to is great. We love you. We love you. We love you. And thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.